All right, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna be checking out Shutterstock, ticker symbol SSTK. And we got a 10 year chart up right now and we can see it has been destroyed lately. Um, you know, somewhat recent highs over the last couple of years of about 120, 125, something like that. And it's sitting at about $40 right now. So man, has this thing gotten wrecked lately. And uh, so from the low, it looks like we're still about 56% uh, up from the low. Uh, from the high, we're down about uh, 67%. So yeah, these these lows are probably back in about 2016 or so. So it's been a while since, uh, since it's been down here. Um, looking over the last 12 months, uh, five-year average multiple uh, net income, usually around 2.95%, EBIT yield 3.55, free cash flow yield 4.96, operating cash flow yield 7%. And so that's the five-year average of the last 12 months. Net income yields about 7.6, EBIT yields 8.64, free cash flow yield is 9.08, and operating cash flow yield is about 13.15. But as we will see eventually in the financials, um, they used to have a pretty large cash pile, and that cash pile is kind of dwindled. So on an enterprise value basis, um, it's it's a little bit different if we look at that enterprise value. So um, yeah, it's been beaten down. It's looking kind of interesting. And yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the investor relations page and the latest uh, quarterly report that we can see. So this is Shutterstock. And if you're not familiar with the business, just think of like um, licensed stock footage that you can use in graphics, design, um, media, marketing, things like that. But as we will see, they've had a lot of like kind of bolt-on acquisitions where they've gotten a lot of companies um, previously over the last like 10 years and they kind of it seems like they take the the media of those companies kind of integrate it into Shutterstock but then they also let the companies kind of like run on the side um, without really necessarily integrating the company completely into Shutterstock so it seems like they have a knack for acquiring companies that might have a little bit better synergies or they might be able to improve Shutterstock and the company that they acquired with the media content libraries that they already have. So let's go into the investor presentation. All right, so one of the acquisitions that they recently did was Giphy or Jiffy, Jiffy Giphy, Jiffy peanut butter, jelly. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So they just recently acquired, acquired Giphy and they bought it from Meta. Uh, Meta purchased Giphy several years ago and they purchased it for, I, I want to say it was between 350 to 400 million. They ran into regulatory issues in the UK and because of that, they had to sell off Giphy and Shutterstock picked it up for like 53 million. So Meta took about a $350 million loss on that. Um, uh, Shutterstock, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty, <laughs> it's chump change for Meta, but for Shutterstock, that's a pretty dang good deal, um, depending on how they can monetize it. Now, in their latest quarterly report, it was either this quarter or quarter previously, they did actually have to take a gain on the acquisition, like they didn't pay enough for Giphy. So it came through as like a net gain, <laughs> um, which was kind of interesting. I mean, we'll see if that pans out, but they have kind of indicated some different plans for the Giphy acquisition. Most of it um, kind of revolves around uh, using Giphy and using their current kind of I don't know, capabilities to do ad campaigns for different companies. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. We'll see um, what this actually kind of produces. Daily users wise, I think, yeah, 1.7 billion people use Giphy on a daily basis. So that's just, that's crazy. Kind of, kind of the, the platforms that Giphy is on, obviously Facebook, um, and other other messaging platforms, um, how how Giphy is used across all of these different platforms, it, it has a pretty big reach. So it'll be interesting to see um, how they can take advantage of that and how they can monetize that. And I don't necessarily think that this is going to be a plug-in to the current share stock stock offerings. Um, I think it's going to be a lot like the the previous acquisitions where they kind of like they acquire it, they take all of the in this 
case gifts they integrate it as best as they, they can into maybe the sh current shutterstock ecosystem if like there's even a need to integrate it but then they try to use the cross functionality of the platform to kind of i don't know boost it up make it a little bit better and then kind of keep giphy or whatever company that they acquired like running on the side independently and just help them bring a little bit more synergies into that ecosystem if they can. So it'll be very interesting to see um, if they can monetize this very well through their ad offerings. And I believe listening to, yeah, yeah, monetization efforts really are going to be focused in on 2024. Um, and that's what they've indicated on multiple conference calls. So We'll see. We will see what 2024 brings. They haven't given us any guidance for 2024 yet. They're just guiding out to 2023. And they recently um, increased guidance for 2023. So we'll see. <laughs> they've, they've been getting some tailwinds uh, from different areas of the business and some headwinds from others. And the biggest... Um, bearish thesis that I can see against Shutterstock and their ecosystem is really AI and AI generative images, um, basically reducing the need for any type of stock photography because they'll be used. They'll just use AI to create their stock photography that they need for their brand and marketing. But I think you could probably run into some legal issues with using that AI stock or AI generative images. So here we have the investor presentation. I will link to this in the description below. But um, yeah, it goes through basically a decent amount of um, uh, just the business sectors. And it kind of goes through like the stock imagery, the library they have, the massive amount of contents. Um, and lately in the earnings calls, they've been really harping on the um, ability to monetize their library by essentially licensing it out to larger players to use for their AI image generation learning models, right? <clears throat> so think of like OpenAI um, training an AI model that does AI generative images. Uh, well, they would pay Shutterstock to have access to Shutterstock. The Basically, I think it's like 700 million pieces of content uh, images, and then all of that metadata, they feed uh, that content through their open AI um, image processing like model, learning model, and then it helps kind of train the model for um, a picture recognition and then compiling and the creation of images. So it seems like more and more companies are getting into this type of agreement with Shutterstock where they're actually um, licensing out the model, which tends to be a higher upfront fee. Um, or licensing out the content it tends to be a higher upfront fee and then maybe smaller like five-year deals, residual de deals after that. <clears throat> but I believe they now have contracts with OpenAI, Meta, I think Google has a contract with them. Um, and you can tell that management has been pretty bullish or seems pretty bullish on this going forward. What I have interpreted, it seems like it could be a longer term sustainable revenue source. The downside is that we don't know exactly how even or how smooth that revenue source is going to be. Now, where they have been lacking is their e-commerce revenue has kind of been dwindling. So e-commerce is uh, basically 61%, enterprise revenue is about 39%. So re enterprise seems to be pretty strong. E-commerce, think of like a self-service offering, like uh, it, small businesses, individual users, creators, and um, the enterprises might be a little bit larger companies uh, from what I've gathered. So it seems like they did have a decent amount of tailwinds in 2020 when everything kind of went on lockdown. A lot of businesses were pushed online and... Well, what happens when you get pushed online or you're, there's a big push to going online? Well, you're going to have a lot more like online digital advertising, marketing, website building, things like that. So it seems like this probably is, well, it's definitely at least a normalization, but is this going to sustain and is like this shrink in their e-commerce revenue just going to get lower and lower and lower? We'll see. And if that's the case, you know, can the AI um, tailwind 
um, have enough revenue generation in the future to offset that to where they continue to potentially grow. Now they do point out that their content has been expanding to faster growing TAMs, but man, I'm just disappointed. I'm, I'm not silly. I'm not seeing the uh, the $180 trillion TAMs here, you know? It's only like a $4.3 billion TAM, $1.3. <laughs> I'm joking around. Um, it <laughs> might be one of the few slide decks where I think they actually are pretty honest maybe about their TAM. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, it looks like most of, the, most of their um, addressable markets, they're expecting probably about 6% to 10% like natural um, growth within that uh, addressable market for that type of content or that type of offering. And they've also no noted that they've tried to incorporate more tech design tools editing things like into shutterstock to kind of make the experience a little bit more sticky for customers so they're not necessarily just coming to or the goal is that they're not necessarily just coming to download stock imagery and then go somewhere else to do the edits and the uh, content creation but maybe they can stick some of that um stickiness within the shutterstock ecosystem by offering those type of tools then here we just kind of get a nice flywheel of like how they see the business and as the content engine is going to be at the core and then we're going to have like a creative engine off the side. Okay, that's where they can do their design and stuff. And but we still have this huge content library and content engine. Oh, and then we're also going to have a data engine. Oh, new products and partners and metadata. And, you know, metadata is really big with AI training models. And so they're kind of just slowly expanding off of this and um, trying to gain uh, probably some synergies between the, these type of product offerings that will uh, potentially make uh, people stick around longer on Shutterstock. So they're doing more of the full end-to-end -end ecosystem of the uh, sourcing of the stock material and the um, creation of the designs or the marketing materials on Shutterstock. I'm not super bullish on that. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to fare against, you know, another popular player like Adobe. I think one of the like power, more powerful things that they have is just the size of their content library. But that's more specifically a benefit for um, AI generative image model training. So I think that's kind of really where we could see some future potential tailwinds at. And then here we go through like movies and films and there's just, there is a lot. Like there is so much with Shutterstock. It, it's really hard to like com comprehend like how many, <laughs> how many uh, companies this Shutterstock has acquired over the last like 10 years. Let's, let's try to find a chart of that right now just to get a better idea. So we can see that uh, Shutterstock has acquired 14 companies, including nine in the last five years. So they are on just an acquisition spree, and usually I do not like acquisitions. Um, typically, I don't see a lot of acquisitions plugged in well, um, so I don't know. A lot of times acquisitions just aren't my jam. Um, now I tried to find a better layout. I couldn't really do that. All of it was paywalled um, as far as what, uh, well, who and when all these acquisitions happened. But some of the acquisitions will, Giphy is just happening. And then we have, um, I believe, let's see, Pond5 was an acqu acquisition. Turbo Squid was an acquisition. Um, which is a 3D content marketplace. Pick money, pick money, pick monkey was an acquisition, um, uh, which is a online graphic design and image image editing platform. So a lot of these, like, there's a theme, right? Like, it seems like a ton of acquisitions, but they all kind of plug in nicely. And but even after they acquire them, what I'm noticing a lot of times is that they continue to run on their own website they continue to run kind of separately and then it seems like shutterstock might just point people to them go ahead and do your own dd on the um acquisition side and all of those companies because i'm i'm not gonna get through it in a video i'm sorry it's just it's not gonna happen but you know what let's dive into the historical financials and see what we can find and let's just go into the income statement and we will yeah let's go into the income statement 
So we can see we've had obviously pretty dang good in uh, top line growth and a decent amount of bomb line expansion here recently. However, I think this last, yeah, this last quarter was that kind of one off with the um, net income boost from the underpaying of Giphy. Um, so yeah, we can see pretty decent trend lines. Uh, weighted sh average shares out, uh, weighted average shares outstanding diluted. Huh. Um, pretty flat, you know, not a ton of growth. Um, so they haven't really been diluting a ton. Uh, we can see decent EPS growth, uh, balance sheet. Now this is what kind of gets interesting. They were really cash heavy for a while. Yeah, <laughs> really cash heavy. Um, you know, oh geez, uh, 428 million in cash. So just over the last couple of years, um, since let's say the, yeah, the end of 2020, uh, 428 million in cash. And now they're down to about 87 million. So they've gone through what, like 350 million in pretty much acquisitions over the last uh, couple of years. They've been very, very, very acquisitive over the last couple of years. Um, but at the same time, uh, actually, you know what, they probably paid off a nice chunk of short term debt as well. Yeah, it does look like they did that. So so the acquisitions is probably split between acquisitions, short-term debt payoff, and yeah, they are. I mean, and they're they're in a pretty dang good debt position. Shoot, short-term, long-term, like debt is not really that big of a deal for them. Um, they got about eighty-seven million on hand, and we got about oh, what thirty million in long-term debts, thirty million in short-term debts. Yeah, so not not too shabby. Now we do see a, <laughs> a nice amount of goodwill increase, and that's kind of where <laughs> where those acquisitions go. So we see a huge drop in uh, short term investments and cash, and during the same time through those acquisitions, we see a very very large increase in goodwill from about eighty nine million to three eighty four. 383 so yeah it's pretty much just the inverse you can see exactly where that went to went to acquisitions over the last couple of years <clears throat> so let's go over to the free cash flow statement all right and we can see uh, operating cash flow has been pretty dang steady and it's grown a decent clip over the last couple of years but i think right now the market is kind of betting that uh, we're going to normalize and this is going to go back down and a lot of that depends on how they can milk this giphy acquisition in 2024 and how um, stable and how much of a tailwind this potential, you know, AI boom has for them uh, with leasing out their library. Um, that's really going to be kind of the bull case here. So stock-based compensation we can see is pretty tame. It's not that bad. Um, capital expenditures and investment in property equipment, um, you know, pretty, you know, yeah, pretty stable. Nothing, nothing crazy. Um, we go down to free cash flow and the stock-based compensation, and we can see there's been a bit of a bump in stock-based compensation. Um, when we go to the free cash flow, we see there was a bit of a debt repayment, about what 50 million in 2023. Uh, we did have some common stock repurchases, and I believe they do have around 100 million in authorizations right now for common stock repurchases. So if they're Cash flow is um, solid. It'll be very interesting to see if they are buying back at these depressed levels. All right, going over the ratio of metrics, let's get through this. Dun, dun, dun. We can see that margins have uh, been pretty dang good, and they've actually expanded recently over the last couple of years. Um, gross margins kind of went from around 56%, currently sitting at about 59%, peaked at around 66%. And we can see their bottom line margins grew pretty healthily, um, going for about, what is that, around 5% up to, you know, maybe 10, 11%, but with some flux here and there. Now their pre-tax and their net margins over the last quarter are going to be skewed from that one-time income uh, anomaly. So, yeah, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, per share metrics over the years, we can see have grown pretty, pretty nicely. Um, they have definitely, you know, created a decent amount of value over the last 10 years. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they're still trading down pretty good on it. Uh, return on capital, 
return on equity employed, decent. Per share metrics, operating cash flow per share, free cash flow per share, and net income per share, per share on a yearly basis, we can see is pretty decent. Um, yeah, so not too bad, especially operating cash flow per share. Uh, it's seen a nice boost. So not too bad at all. Common stock repurchase. There we go. And then here is kind of where it gets interesting because we can see the enterprise value in the marquee app. Um, and really like we see they had all that cash on hand, right? And then they started in 2020, started spending off that cash, spending off that cash, spending off that cash. And then by about 2022, that cash was basically gone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, their enterprise value caught up with their market cap. And uh, yeah, so now we're we're basically on a enterprise value basis. We're back to maybe around like uh, 2020 levels, maybe a little bit lower than 2020. So yeah, interesting. Even though on a like PE basis or a operating cash flow yield basis, um, they look a lot cheaper right now than they did previously. Well, they have a lot less cash on hand right now. So we have to take that into account when we do the evaluation. Um, and yeah, let's go ahead. The other thing that I did want to know with Shutterstock is, geez, the insider ownership is insane. Um, the founder still owns like 20, 25%. He's steadily been selling off and decreasing his stake. Um, and honestly, I probably would too if I had the majority of my, my net worth in a company. So let's see if we can find that real quick. All right, so here we go. And share stocks has about 36 million, uh, yeah, 36.41 million shares outstanding as of 2023. And we can see that the founder um, has over 11 million shares. So geez, that's like, is that almost, that's 30-ish percent of the float? 30% of ownership around. Dang. So probably 25 to 30% of ownership. That's a lot. And um, if we look at the previous history for um, Shutterstock, mostly it's going to be sales from, um, yeah, from John Oringer. Um, and you know what? Don't blame it at all. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, if we look over just the sales, yeah, you can see it's just him. And he's basically just selling a little bit of shares, like, every what is it every month every couple months yeah two times a month two to four times a month he's just got constant sales going in he's just constantly decreasing his stake um i have no issue with that concerning like given how much that he owns yeah i don't have any issues with that like he's using this to probably just diversify his wealth out of this single company and yeah, he's got like 30% ownership in it. So yeah, I I have no issues with that at all. If we go back to here, let's see, this is 2021. Around the 20, end of 2021, he had 12.7 million shares held. And now he's got about 11 million shares held. So he's decreased his stake maybe, what is that, maybe 5%? I don't know, I'm pulling numbers on my head. So he's just, he's decreased his stake a little bit. But given the crazy percentage that he owns of the company, um, yeah, not something I'm super worried about. And how could I forget the dividends, guys? How could I forget the dividends? So I think it pays about a 2%, 2.5% dividend right now. Let me go look real quick. Yeah, we're at 2.57% uh, trailing dividend yield right now. And if we look at that dividend, well, it's, uh, it's pretty healthy. It's, it's pretty dang healthy. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, what the dividend payout ratio is about 19.4% right now. So not, not that high at all. Um, and we can see historically, you know, it's kind of hovered between the, you know, maybe 20%, 23 to 30, 40% area, uh, with a little bit of spike here and then a downtrend again. So, I mean, adjusting for that one-time net income uh, anomaly, yeah, we're probably around that 24% area on the dividend payout ratio. And then on a yearly basis here, we can see the growth of the operating income, EBIT, net income, and free cash flow. And we can kind of see the um, margins on a yearly basis as well. And we do see the, the expansion of those bottom line margins. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's looked pretty nice over the last couple of years. Um, bottom line yields, oh, man, we can see this I historically traded pretty rich. And now it's just, it's kind of in the gutter. We got a free cash flow yield of 9.8%, a, uh, let's see, a EBIT yield of 8.64%, and a net yield of 7.6%. So very um, pretty discounted, even after adjusting for the decreasing cash. On the balance sheet, it's still pretty discount, uh, discounted relative to the you know, historical yield multiples, historical valuations. So, yeah, pretty pretty interesting. Um, let's see. Yeah, we see a little bit of common stock repurchased here. Uh, dividends, we can see a very minor dividend payout compared to their operating cash flow and their net income. So, yeah, pretty pretty reasonable. The uh, quick ratio, current ratio, see it's down, trended down a little bit. Um, let's see here. And with that being said, over the last five years, we've had bottom line growth average about 24.89%. But remember, they've done a lot of acquisitions, right? So if we assume that some of that top line growth and some of that margin expansion was from the acquisitions and from the synergies or the improvements, the synergies that they had between the companies with the acquisitions, that's probably going to slow down, or I, I'm at least going to assume that's going to slow down because I'm going to assume that they're going to be potentially less acquisitive going forward since they have drained that cash pile a bit. So I use financial modeling prep for all of the um, API queries for my spreadsheets. And I do have a referral to financial modeling prep in the description below. It takes about 20% off of the normal pricing. Additionally, if you want access to this valuation template, you can join the Stone Cold Investors Discord. And that link will be in the description below. And the valuation template is available to all supporters of the Discord. You can become a supporter of the Discord by writing three different valuation or company write-ups in the Stone Cold Investors Discord, or if you don't wanna do any of that and you just wanna lurk around, you can sign up for a $5 a month supporter tier, which will give you access to the channel that has the valuation template. All right, so for the valuation here, um, we have a target rate of 17.5% uh, total, and then after we add on the 2.5% dividend, that's about a 20% target rate. What I'm doing for this is that I am actually factoring in the potential that they have um, net buybacks, and net buybacks in the range of about, uh, you know, I could I should increase that, probably three. And there we go. Oh, nope, sorry, neg three. Uh, buybacks of about 2.3% a year in the best case scenario, or down to, I can reduce that as well, down to around 0.73% buybacks in the worst case scenario, uh, just to get a little bit of a spread. But we do, I, I do believe they have about 100 million left on their buyback plan. So, yeah, they got some room for buybacks there. Um, bottom line growth, you know what? With the acquisitions, they're doing about 24%. That included some margin expansion. The revenue's growing at about 8%, 8.24%. We don't really know... We don't really know how the Giphy acquisition is going to play out and how they're going to be able to monetize that. So, I mean, there, there's so many things, variables that could flip to make this really, really good and really, really bad. <laughs> like... The spread is crazy because if they, like if if AI is a long term threat, and if um, the licensing out of their library doesn't really stick with a lot of the um, AI modeling or the AI uh, owners of the AI that are doing the modeling and then offering the AI generative images, um, if that doesn't stick and their ecom uh, sales continues declining, then we could be in a pretty bad situation. Um, on the other hand, you know, if, if Giphy takes off, if they're able to monetize that well, then we see some tailwinds from that. Um, there's just, there's so many ways that this one could play out. It's pretty interesting, um, but we'll see. So what I have for bottom line growth right here is I have a range of 6% to 14, basically 15%. Um, so 6% in scenario one up to 14.8% uh, in the best case scenario. And then on the overall yields, um, we're basically setting our five-year target yields between around 7% yield multiple for the lowest scenario to about 3.99% in the best case. And yeah, that gives us a pretty good range. Um, I mean, I like, because they are trading at a historically low 
um, or high yield multiple right now. Um, so the valuation just looks like it's being priced for a lot of negativity, a lot of contraction, a uh, slow decline in the business. Um, it's not, it's not being priced for a lot of good long-term tailwinds. That's for sure. Um, if we get to the end of five years, they do, you know, 6% growth. Like they're, they're most likely going to be valued somewhat reasonably. Um, on a multiple basis. So I'm using seven to 4%. So I don't know. I think I'm thinking somewhere in here, <laughs> some, it's just somewhere in there. And then if the market does sell, sell them off a ton and they, um, are still having really, really good cash flow, then they buy back stock. So they're in a powerful position to do that, assuming that the business stays stable and they have those cash flows and that firepower to buy back stock. Um, so with those with those assumptions <laughs> I don't know with those assumptions we got a scenario one buy price of thirty dollars and thirteen cents we got a scenario two buy price of thirty seven sixty seven scenario three buy price is forty eight oh seven scenario four is sixty two eighty nine scenario five is eighty four ninety seven the spread on this is just absolutely insane <laughs> like so current fair value I've got pretty much anywhere between around $49 to maybe like $61 right now, maybe even 70s right now. Um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think the market is just very uncertain about it. There's a really, really wide range of scenarios that could play out for this one. Yeah. So fair value, probably right, right now between about 60 and 50 bucks is what I'm coming out with. Five-year targets in the worst case scenario is about $68.90. And in the scenario two, we got 86.14 for the five-year target. Uh, scenario three got 109. Uh, scenario four, we got 143. And scenario five, we got 194. Uh, yeah, five-year KGARs in scenario one. Well, <laughs> five-year KGAR from today's price you know, if it was from the 4083 in these different scenarios, if they were to play out, uh, we got a 11% KR in the, in the scenario one, 16% KR in scenario two, 21.91% KR in scenario three, um, 28% KR in scenario four, 36% KR in scenario five. So yeah, really widespread. And <laughs> the issue, the issue with this, if they do decline, and if we go from bottom line growth to just constantly shrinking, like let's just say negative 27. Um, yeah, I mean, then, then we're really far off, right? We're really far off. And this could be dead money for a long time. Um, so it, it's just hard to say. Um, I, think, I think as the next year to play out, especially especially after management gives 24 guidance, because they have 2023 guidance right now, they raised their guidance, but they haven't really released 2024 guidance yet. So when 2024 guidance comes out, I think that's gonna be pretty um, a pretty big moment because it's going to tell the market, like management's basically gonna tell the market um, what they think is gonna happen from the AI library uh, leasing revenue essentially that whole side of the business um we're gonna get a little bit more clarity on that and we should get some clarity on how they feel they're gonna be able to monetize monetize uh, the giphy acquisition because they have noted that um they think monetization for giphy is gonna come in that uh 2024 year so this it could be an interesting one you know there's there's some really good bull cases and there's some really good bear cases so it's going to be an interesting one to watch i will say i listened to the last four or five years of conference calls for them uh what i've noticed is that just through the company's history they they seem to have a pretty good um ability to pivot the business and to do acquisitions and to kind of sneak their way through to where they stay profitable um although currently i'm not sure if i'm a huge fan of the current ceo he kind of feels like he's just a placeholder CEO. I'm not sure if I'm totally bought into him yet, but um, yeah, the the founder John um, is still, I believe, on a, what, an executive on the board of directors, something like that. Um, he seems like he's pretty involved, and he's got like a 25, 30 percent ownership stake. So I'm I'm sure he's <laughs> gonna want to keep his eye on stuff, 
and he's he wants his company to succeed i'm i'm, I'm sure that that's a that's a healthy chunk of change that he has invested in this so yeah i don't know shutterstock we'll see what happens it's it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting one i'm really i'm really interested to watch this one um play out over the next you know 12 18 24 months it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens with this one so all right hope you guys are having a great day have a great week and we'll talk to you later as always, I am not a financial advisor and none of this is financial advice. This is just my musings on another company and another potential valuation. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like and subscribe button and we'll see you in the next one.